the rest of the story. It was a warm, blue-skyed August afternoon in the town of Arnhem. But in the deep, damp cellar, a 15-year-old pigtailed schoolgirl named Edda shivered and wept. The Nazis had occupied the Netherlands forever, it seemed, and yet this particular hiding place had been overlooked by both captives and captors until scrawny little Edda, pursued by German soldiers fleeing through the streets, had found it and sought refuge there. Trembling, she remembered all of the close calls, like the time the soldier stopped her, pointed his machine gun at her, and told her to take off her shoes. There was nothing in her shoes that day. Young Edda van Heemstra, however, was indeed a courier for the Dutch resistance, and she had concealed innumerable coded messages in her shoes, delivered them for the underground forces. Not all in her family had been as fortunate as she in avoiding disaster. A half-brother had been dragged off to a concentration camp. One of her favorite uncles had been arrested by the Gestapo and shot. A beloved cousin was similarly executed. The extreme shortage of food in Arnhem left Edda permanently hungry, and nonetheless she managed to muster the strength to dance and play the piano in the town conservatory in recitals which provided an excuse for public assembly, a cover for meetings of the underground. But now it seemed the girl's luck had run out. Only minutes before, Nazi soldiers rounding up Dutch women to work in military kitchens had detained Edda. They were marching her off to headquarters with a group of other captives. Suddenly she broke free and fled around a corner and up an alley and down into the forgotten cellar of this abandoned building. And there, in the darkness, she huddled among the empty boxes. Through a small ceiling height window, she could see the boots of her pursuers. And yet even after they passed and the streets were silent once more, Edda was certain that her capture was only a matter of time. And so there, on the dusty, cold floor, she curled up and sank into deep despair. In her leather satchel, there were yet a few crusts of stale bread, some apple juice, and a small flask. She would keep those meager rations from the hungry rats and sustain herself as long as she could. But if the Nazis wanted her, they were going to have to find her. Well, the night passed, and then the day and another night. And then, so many days and nights that the sick and frightened girl lost track. What little food she had 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 long since been consumed. Now the cramping agony of starvation held her in its grasp. Finally, the pain in her stomach drove her to a desperate decision. She would wait until the next nightfall to try to make her way home. And she did. She had been missing. She had been hiding, starving in that cellar for 25 days. Almost an entire month. But somehow... She got back home to her mother, and mercifully, a short time later, the town, Arnhem, was liberated. You know the young lady I'm talking about. Oh, yes, you do. You have seen Edda Van Heemstra many, many times, and you will again. But the next time you see her, other pictures will come to your mind. Pictures of a skinny girl in pigtails staring down the muzzle of a Nazi machine gun. Pictures of a child carrying coded messages in her shoes and performing music while the resistance plotted sabotage and then starving in a lonely cellar as the Gestapo thundered through the streets of her hometown of Arnhem. And then you will say to yourself that until right now, you never really knew Audrey Hepburn. But now you know the rest of the story. And now the rest of the rest of the story. Can you imagine if the Nazis had learned about Audrey Hepburn's work during World War II? Film history would certainly be different. Can you imagine Breakfast at Tiffany's, Charade, Roman Holiday, or My Fair Lady with any actress other than Audrey Hepburn? Julie Andrews had played the female lead, Eliza Doolittle, in the Broadway production of My Fair Lady. Although Jack Warner of Warner Brothers knew that people were flocking to see the stage production, he was unsure of Julie Andrews' box office draw. My Fair Lady had a huge budget, about $17 million. Adjusted for inflation, that's about $120 million in today's money. Julie Andrews was virtually unknown at Hollywood at the time. In the same year the production of My Fair Lady began, Julie Andrews was filming Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins and My Fair Lady were both released in 1964. Prior to the release of My Fair Lady, Julie Andrews told reporters, I can't wait to see it. I know I'll cry so hard I'll blot my eyes out. 
Jack Warner was criticized for bypassing Julie Andrews for the role she had become known for on Broadway. Time Magazine remarked, There is an evil and rampantly lunatic force at loose in the world, and it must be destroyed. The evil and lunatic force in the article was Jack Warner. The criticism wasn't just aimed at Jack Warner. They targeted Audrey Hepburn as well. When filming began on My Fair Lady, Audrey Hepburn's singing voice, well, she was no Julie Andrews. When you hear Eliza Doolittle singing in the film, you're not hearing Audrey Hepburn's voice. The studio brought in Marnie Nixon to sing for Audrey. My Fair Lady was a huge box office hit, but Audrey Hepburn was snubbed at the Oscars. Julie Andrews was nominated for an Oscar for her role in Mary Poppins. Upon hearing that Audrey Hepburn was not nominated for an Oscar, Julie Andrews said, I think Audrey should have been nominated. I'm very sorry she wasn't. Julie Andrews won the Oscar for Best Actress of the Year, 1965. Audrey Hepburn received Oscar nominations for her work in Sabrina, The Nun Story, Breakfast at Tiffany's, Wait Until Dark, and Roman Holiday. She won the Oscar for Roman Holiday. Twenty years before Audrey Hepburn filmed My Fair Lady, she was caught up in World War II, as Mr. Harvey explained. Audrey Hepburn was born Audrey Kathleen Rustin on May 4, 1929, to Joseph Rustin and Ella von Heemstra. Her parents divorced when Audrey was 10 years old. During the war, Audrey took on the assumed identity of Etta von Heemstra because it sounded less American than Audrey Rustin. If you're wondering where the name Hepburn comes in, Audrey's father believed he was a descendant of James Hepburn, third husband of Mary Queen of Scots, so he changed his surname to Hepburn Dash Rustin. Audrey later adopted the surname Hepburn. This is beginning to sound like a film introduction on Turner Classic Movies. Hmm, what a dream job that would be. During World War II, Audrey was guided by resistance leader Dr. Hendrik Wissert Hooft. Before the war, Audrey had performed as a ballerina in the Arnhem City Theater. Musical performances were largely prohibited by the Germans. People held Zwarte Avonden, or Black Evenings, so the performers could still earn a little money. They were called Black Evenings because homeowners blacked out their windows so the Germans wouldn't know about the activities going on inside. Audrey first visited a Black Evening on April 23, 1944. Her family, the Van Heemstras, were listed among the families present. It's strange that they kept a record of who was present. It was this performance which led Audrey to participate in other black evenings. By this time, Audrey was suffering from malnutrition, but she was determined to dance. She said later, I was quite able to perform, and it was some way in which I could make some kind of contribution. I did indeed give various underground concerts to raise money for the Dutch resistance movement. I danced at recitals, designing the dances myself. I had a friend who played the piano, and my mother made the costumes. There were very amateurish attempts, but nevertheless, at the time, when there was very little entertainment, it amused people and gave them an opportunity to get together and spend pleasant afternoons listening to music and seeing my humble attempts. The recitals were given in homes with windows and doors closed, and no one knew they were going on. Afterwards, money was collected and given to the Dutch underground. Guards were posted outside to let us know when Germans approached. The best audiences I ever had made not a single sound at the end of my performance. In many cases such as this, silence was more meaningful than any sound a crowd could make. Had the Germans heard the disturbance? Had they learned about the black evenings? it's likely that everyone present would have been executed. One day, Audrey and her mother were walking down a street and stopped at a street corner near a large bank made of brick and stone. It was described as being the most solid structure in the area. Audrey said she heard the most awful sounds coming out of this building. It was then explained to me by my mother that it was a prison and perhaps people were being tortured. Those are things you don't forget. One by one, people known to Audrey's family, including the village leaders and pastors, 
disappeared at the hands of the Germans. Most of them died in concentration camps. In 1944, Dr. Wizertuft sent Audrey on a mission to take a message and maybe some food to a downed Allied pilot. Audrey was perfect for the mission. At 15, the Germans didn't suspect Audrey of subterfuge. She was deemed safe by the Germans, and she was fluent in English while most other young people in the village didn't speak English at all. Audrey quickly located the pilot and delivered the message. Go to this place, say these words, and the people will help you. While returning to the village, Audrey saw Nazi policemen approaching. Audrey was a quick thinker. She noticed that wildflowers were blooming all around her. She began picking the wildflowers. When the Nazi policeman approached her, she remained silent, smiled, and gave the flowers to the Nazi policeman. They accepted the flowers, checked her official papers, and walked on, oblivious to Audrey's mission. Audrey always downplayed her contribution to the war effort. She said every little Dutch schoolgirl and boy did their little bit to help. Many were more courageous than I was. Audrey certainly was courageous. Today, Audrey Hepburn is mostly remembered for her film work. Her part in World War II has largely been forgotten. So the next time you see Audrey Hepburn in a film, maybe you'll see her in a slightly different light. Her name, Audrey Hepburn, should be listed among the many heroes of World War II. Don't you think? I'm Brad Dyson. Thanks for watching. And as Paul Harvey would say, good day.